We're good? Okay. So, like we just said, last week we covered uh, Luke 16 and the parable of the unjust steward. And we're actually continuing in, uh, in Luke 16 today because the next parable I wanted to cover was like the next parable in there. And, um, excuse me. I do want to say that I feel like we've been kind of doing the parables for a while now, and I don't know exactly how many weeks we've been doing it. We've been doing it for like a really, really long time. Um, and although I'm not wholly like decided on this, but this might be the last one because then I basically get two weeks and then I actually, I'm going on a trip. So um, the next two weeks, I might just go rogue and talk about other stuff outside of parables because I like doing that too. Um, but we'll see kind of where, where kind of God leads us. But if you guys want to open your Bibles and kind of follow along, I'm going to kind of break this apart into little chunks and we'll kind of we'll read a little bit and then we'll kind of digest it. We'll read a little bit and then we'll kind of digest it. So we're going to be in Luke 16 and we're actually going to pick up uh, in verse 19, which is a rich man and Lazarus. Uh, I hope you guys are familiar with this. Um, it's, it's one of those parables that's kind of short. So even today's message isn't going to be uber long, but, um, but it's great. But before we do that, I want to kind of set the stage a little bit. Because if you remember when we finished with um, the parable of the unjust steward, the last thing, uh, the last verse um, that we kind of covered was speaking about how you cannot serve God and mammon, right? About how you can't worship two gods, right? Like you have money and you have God and, you know, you've got to choose one. You, you just can't do them both, right? Um, and then there's this little section here where between these two parables, so he's talking about the parable of the unjust steward, He's going to talk about the rich man of Lazarus, and he drops a couple verses kind of in the middle there that I just kind of wanted to highlight. Because if you remember what we were talking about before, and he finishes up about the fact that, you, you know, it's either God or money, you can't worship both, worship both, and we're going into this other parable, but he says in verse 14, it says, Now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, also heard these things and derided him. And he said to them, You are those who, un who justify yourselves before men. But God knows your hearts, for what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God, right? And if you go back to the original language, this derived him part, right? Like that kind of loses, like we all read that, we're like, yeah, I don't really know what that means, so we just kind of pass over it. But what it translates over to in the original text is they turned up their nose at him, right? Because Christ is addressing something that's very, very sensitive to them. Right? And he's talking to him about like this love of money and the way that if you have a, a love of money and greed and pursuit of all of that, you can't wholeheartedly love God. And they literally turn their nose up at them. Right? And you have to understand that at the time, the Pharisees, the scribes, the lawyers, these were the ones that should have known the law better than anyone else. And it's seen in the way that they lived because they made a whole big deal out of the letter of the law. Right? Like they, they, they made such a big deal out of like, you know, like in the Old Testament, one of the things was you can't plow on the, on the Sabbath. Well, the Pharisees took that and they actually even added in and they said, well, you can't move a, a chair across the ground on the Sabbath because the, it could be dusty. And we don't want God to confuse that as plowing, right? So you have to understand that the Pharisees, they took God's commandments and they just built and built and built and built on it, right? To the fact that the letter of the law was such a burden that it was breaking the backs of the people, right? And you have to understand that they knew the law. They understood the law in and out. But, and when they executed it, they didn't execute it for a love of God. They executed it for a love of themselves, a love for praise, and the fact that they loved the way that people respected them, right? And the, and the, and the Lord declares, he says that, it, you know, what you feel is highly esteemed, Right? What you guys think that, like, you know, this is what it's all about is an abomination. <laughs> we got a lot of kids walking up some Gatorades right now. <laughs> What's up, guys? <laughs> Next generation right there. Um, but it says that this is an abomination in the sight of God. Right? So you have to understand that we just talked about the unjust steward. He, he rebukes, like, the Pharisees openly about, like, their love for praise, their love for money, and all of this stuff, right? And now we're going to roll into the next parable. So I'm just going to read 19, 19 through 21. It says, There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared um, sumptuously every day. 
And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell off the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. That's tough, right? Like, that's tough. You got to understand that this is Christ himself teaching this, right? And this parable is unique for, for a couple of reasons here. One of the details that stands out kind of like right away is that only one of them is named, okay? So you got a rich man, then you have poor Lazarus, right? Only one of them is named. And some of the church fathers will say there's only one of them named because this was a real story, that this wasn't just a parable, right? But that actually, this was a real story that happened. So the name was admitted to protect the guilty. <clears throat> and some, when it comes to Lazarus, some people even say, hey, is this the Lazarus that was raised from the dead? And when you go through all the scriptures, there's nothing that points to that. There's nothing to allude to that. And there's nothing that ever says that Lazarus, the sister of Mary and Martha, was ever a beggar or poor like, or, or ever even hinted to it right? But St. Gregory had a beautiful meditation on this, right? Because one thing that is clear about what God does right in the scripture is that God knows the poor and God knows the outcast, right? He knows those who patiently endure hardship. And that is why he knew him by name. And if you look through all of these parables, Christ makes a point to go out of his way to lift up the social outcasts the prostitutes, the tax collectors, the sinners. These are the ones that not only God knew, but that God pursued. And you see that even in this parable here, that he knows the man who suffered intimately by name. But the rich man, think about that, right? Like, like the rich man, he did not, right? Because we all know the verse where it says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Like that was the rich man in this story. So before we go any further, I'm going to tell you who do we identify for, uh, with, right? Because if you look at the story, you have one person who has way too much, right? Like it's very, very clear that, that this rich man had way, way, way too much. In itself is not a sin, right? But was, what was his sin? His sin was the fact that he completely overlooked those in need, right? Like we could be that guy, okay? Or maybe we can be the beggar. Right? And maybe it's not a beggar because we need money or crumbs that fall off of a table, but because we are lonely and meek of heart, and we know how much we need, and we know how much we depend on him, and every good thing comes from him. And we, we see ourselves in that manner. Right? And I will tell you, the rich man was not sinful just because of his possessions of wealth. Right? Because he does make a point to say that you know, he had much, he had nice clothes, he had extravagant meals. <clears throat> you know, but it was evident that that wasn't what the problem was. The problem was that no one, no one in that rich man's house, right? Not the rich man, not one of his servants, not anyone had pity on Lazarus. They didn't, they didn't have pity on him at all, right? And it is clear that the rich man saw Lazarus often, and we'll kinda, we, can, we can see that later in the parable, right? But it's clear that he, he saw him possibly daily and he ignored him. And I will tell you, when I was preparing this, that is a convicting thing to think about, right? Because how many forgotten people do we pass by daily and just blatantly ignore them, right? And it's crazy because they even make a point where I believe that not a single word in this Bible is, is by chance, right? It makes a point to say that even the dogs were more merciful to Lazarus than this man, right? His sin was the failure to have mercy on Lazarus and that he had wealth, but he hoarded it to himself. It was all about what he needed, what he wanted, and indulgences. It says that he ate extravagantly, but he wouldn't share even from his abundance, right? And we understand here in this parable that Lazarus, Lazarus was a righteous man, Right? It's understood in this parable that his, his life was pleasing to God because it says in the coming verses that the angels themselves came and carried him to the bosom of Abraham. So Lazarus was clearly a righteous man. We also know that he was laid at the rich man's gate. So he didn't choose to be there. In the verse it says that he would be laid there. And all he wanted was the crumbs which fell off the table. 
And I want to make a quick point on this really quick because not all poverty is righteous. You know, I know sometimes we'll look at the monks, right? And the monks take the, a vow of poverty. And we think, okay, well, you know, if the monks take a vow of poverty, then that's, that's what righteousness means. That's what it means to be holy, to like not have anything. And that's, there's, no, there's no evidence of that. Don't, don't get it confused, right? When we look at Lazarus, it's not his poverty that makes him righteous, right? It's his patience. It's his endurance. It's his acceptance of God's will for him, right? Like you don't see any bitterness creep into Lazarus here, Right? All of that stuff, right, like the patience, endurance, and acceptance of God's will for us, that can make us righteous, not the poverty, right? And some of the fathers will even say that he had been laid at the door of this rich man as an opportunity to the rich man, an opportunity for him to have mercy and soften his heart when day by day by day he would go and he would see this man in need. Every day he was confronted with another opportunity to do what was good. Ephesians 3, where it talks about the fact that like God has set out good works for us to walk through. Like Lazarus here could have been a good work set out for the rich man to walk through, but he neglected it and ignored it. And I wonder for us, how many opportunities are there where God has put us in situations where we can have mercy and help somebody around us that needs it? But just like the rich man, we completely turn a blind eye to it and we go along our, our way. So this rich man in this story, he did not take that opportunity. The good work was laid out for him. He did not walk through it, right? And I just want us to think about all of the inconveniences in our life. Because I think we all have inconveniences and I'll be honest with you, the biggest times to bless somebody is at the time when it's most inconvenient. Like it might have been inconvenient for this rich man to step out of his way and to help Lazarus. You know, you could already tell that Lazarus was a bit, of a, a bit of a hot mess, you know, with all the sores on him that the dogs would come and lick, right? It probably was an inconvenience, possibly even, you know, disgusting to go help Lazarus, right? And I'm going to tell you that those opportunities in our life where we are supposed to step out and to help people, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be pleasant. It's not going to be something that we're naturally drawn to, but it's our job as people who have received grace who have received mercy is to give that as well. And it's not going to be convenient, right? You know, you can also imagine, you know, Lazarus in this situation, great. It was for the benefit of the rich man that Lazarus was laid there as an opportunity for him, right? To do something good and to bless somebody else for his own sake, right? Imagine the amount of suffering that Lazarus had to, had to go through for this. Just imagine that, right? Because it must have been intensified being so close to abundance. So close to somebody who has so much and unwilling to share it. But it doesn't mention a single complaint from Lazarus. And I think for me, like, that's, that's convicting because in the story, I would say if we had to err on the side of one, we are the rich man and we are surrounded by poverty and we have much and we are not willing to share it. And then in the next passage, from, oh, I'm going to read from 22 to 26. It says, So it was the beggar died, which was Lazarus, and he was carried by angels to Abraham's bosom. Can you wrap your mind around that real quick? Like, just wrap your mind around the fact that when he died, okay, the person that you would think would be forgotten about, the person that you would think that probably nobody cried over, Right? A matter of fact, the rich man's house was probably glad that like, he was not going to be the eyesore that he once was. Completely forgotten about. But God never forgot about him. Not only did he not forget about him, he sent angels to carry him where? To the bosom of Abraham? Like that just, it blows my mind. But anyways, the rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and you are tormented. And besides all of this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that so that those who want to pass 
from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. This part shows that the rich man's suffering in Hades and, and all he needs is just a little bit of relief, right? Just a little bit of relief, like how the tables turned, right? And it's crazy to think of the one person that he asks relief from. Like, I would be like, I would be way too embarrassed <laughs> to like ask it from Lazarus. Like, Lazarus is a guy that I neglected and like I am the one that basically tormented him, all right? But his torment was so bad, you know, like the rich man's torment was so bad, he was just like, just please, please send. And, and Lazarus, he's a good guy, right? <laughs> like, you know, I saw him. You know, there's something about him. I think Lazarus had a sense of righteousness where he even knew that in his time of need, he can go to the person who was righteous. And it, and it testifies to the recognition of Lazarus' goodness in him. And it reminds me of a friend. I have this friend who's uh, he's a very, very outspoken um, Christian. And he's got this, he sends every day, he sends out this like, you know, like word of God email. And he sends like a verse and some scripture and like a meditation. And, and it's one of those emails where you, the, the two is blank. And you know that God only knows how many people he's got online on like the blind carbon copy. So I was telling him, I was like, man, how many emails do you, like how many people do you blast that out to? He's like, oh at least, you know, somewhere between 500 to 1,000. And I said, you are spamming people. Like, I guarantee you not all of those people want it. And he's like, oh, without a doubt. And people re reply back and say, hey, remove me. And I said, you remove them? He says, no, I never remove them. And I was like, why? He says, I'll tell you why, Peter. He's all, because I can't tell you how many times somebody will tell me, remove me, and I don't remove. I told him, sure, and I just don't remove them. And then three years later, the guy's wife leaves. And who does he reach out to? Right? The guy finally comes to terms with his alcoholism. Who does he reach out to? You know, the guy finally, something, somebody loses a child. Who does he reach out to? He's like, it's fine. I'm going to keep sending them. Right? Because when the time gets hard, right? when, something, when they need somebody who knows God, who do they reach out to? And that reminds me of like what happened to Lazarus here. Right? Because this rich man knew that Lazarus was righteous. And he even turned to Lazarus in his time of need, right? And Father Abraham reminded him that time for help has passed. Like, that's it. After, after judgment, no one can help. It's done. It's a done deal. There's nothing we can do to undo that now, right? And after that time has passed, there's no way to turn back from a lifetime, you know, of selfishness. You can't fix that after it's too late. And I will tell you that I believe that every single one of us, 100%, will all have to come face to face with our selfishness. There's not a single one of us. My only question is, is it on this side of eternity or is it on the other side of eternity? Because there will be a day when we're standing before God, right? And if we didn't fix that selfishness while we were on earth, that we'll be tormented, just like this rich man, for the rest, for the rest of eternity. So think about, do you think that that rich man knew that his life was going to be called from him that day? Do you guys think that he knew that that's it, that his story was over? I guarantee you he never in a million years I thought that that was going to be the night. I guarantee you that he thought that he would have more time. You know what? I'll actually even tell you that I promise you that he probably knew he was selfish. He probably knew that he wasn't sharing his stuff. He probably knew that, hey, you know what? If, if it's all over today, then I'm in a world of trouble. But he probably just thought that he had more time. He probably thought, I will get to it. Like right now, I'm going to worry about me. And in the near future, I will worry about other stuff. But right now, it's going to be all about me. And I am sure with a thousand percent that that's exactly how we felt. And I also guarantee you that that's the same exact way that we feel. Are there areas of our life that need to change? 100%. Am I being selfish? 100%. Do I need to care more about other people? 100%. But not right now. There's still more time for that. And my takeaway is, is that this man, when, he's, when he ended up in Hades, he felt immediate regret. Regret. You know, because not only was he tormented, but he also looked at Lazarus in a completely different light. So my question is, is like when we compare ourselves to this man, do we want to wait that long? Do you want to push the envelope to think that like, you know, like I, I probably got a little bit more time? 
I probably got just a little bit longer. And I'll tell you there, I remember this, this story I read. I don't even remember how long ago it was, but it was a long time ago. And it was about three demons getting together. And this could have, I don't remember where I read it. But it was three demons getting together, and they're talking about how do we stump Christians, right? Like, how do, we, how do we stumble them? How do we get them? We don't want them to go to Christ. We don't want them this. We don't want them that. And the first demon said, you know what? We're just going to tell them that God doesn't exist, okay? Like, that's the plan. Tell them God doesn't exist. We'll make them atheists. You know, they, well, they will never even worry about it, right? And the other two demons were like, what are you talking about God doesn't exist? Look around. It is so clear that, like, God exists, right? They're everything, when you look at heaven and earth and everything you can even think of, it is clear that there's a creator, okay? That's never going to work. And then the second, the second demon says, okay, look, tell them God doesn't love them, right? Tell them that there's a God and there's a creator and that God just doesn't love them, right? And the other two demons were like, well, if you really think about it, that's not going to work either, right? Like, if you think about it, you got his son, his son came, his son died, like, he offered his only begotten son, and if you look at it, like, everywhere around us, we're, we're, we see grace everywhere. There is no way we're going to convince people that God doesn't love them. Like, God himself is love. There's, there's no way around it. So they said, okay. So the third one says, all right, I think I got it. We're going to tell them God exists, okay, because we can't deny that. We're going to tell them that God loves them, because we can't deny that. What we're going to tell them, worship him tomorrow. Just worship him tomorrow, right? Let, let today be about you. And all three demons high-fived because that was the best plan ever. Because I think that's where we stand. We all know that God exists. We all know that God loves us. But just let today be about me. And we'll let tomorrow be about him. Then the last portion, uh, verses 27 through 31. And then he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I had five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come into this place of torment. And Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one of them goes from the dead, they will repent. And he said to them, If you do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rises from the dead. And it's crazy because I guess those six apples, and this is just Peter Parent, my guess is that those six apples did not far, fall from the tree, right? Because now you've got him, his five brothers, who apparently really lived lavish, selfish <laughs> lives. So let's just park here for a second, and I want us to think about what are we teaching our kids? What are we teaching our kids? I think it would be easy for us to bash the rich man. I think it would be easy for us to bash all five of his brothers too. But the reality of it is, chances are, there's a good possibility that these kids learned a lot of it from the way that they watched their parents live. And that should be a convicting statement for every single one of us here. Because it's all about how we live. So I wonder, is it his sin, his brother's sin, possibly his parents' sin? because of the fact that it looked like this was a family issue. And it just reminds us, how are we directing our kids? What are we teaching our kids, right? Proverbs 22, 6, it says, train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will never depart from it. And when I think about this, I think about what are the values we're teaching them, the priorities we're teaching them. How are they watching us live our lives? Because it doesn't say that we should tell a child right, where they should go. It doesn't say just tell them. I think if it was just telling them, we'd all be really good at that. And we'd all have angel kids because we can tell them very well. But it says train up. And I believe the, the term train up, is a, it, it's a different level, right? It's by living it, it's by showing them, it's by engaging it with them, watching them do it while we are there. It's this whole other thing. And it always kills me, right, because this, this term train up, and I don't know if you guys ever go to the gym or not, but I will tell you, I have this very, very bad judgmental quality when I go to the gym. Because I will go see out of shape trainers. And I want to be like, how do you get a client? Right? Like, how do I have a fat trainer at the gym trying to train clients? Right? And the same thing, I'm going to tell you, that's like a whole parent-child thing there. How are you telling your kids where to go when you aren't going? when you aren't doing it. It has to match. 
It has to match, right? Claudia, we're going to have to edit that part out. Uh, the fathers wrote that these five brothers are all figures, right? And it talks about like the Jews at the time that were rejecting, the heretics that came after Christ, right? All of this because they all had the teaching of Moses and the other prophets even, you know, that followed Moses. They had the teachings of Christ themselves. All the prophecies, you can imagine all of the prophecies from the Old Testament prophets that were fulfilled in the life of Christ, but they distorted it. And why did they distort it? Because they distorted it to what they wanted it to mean. Because they were looking for something. And we see that we still use this today because if you look even within the church, not our church by the grace of God, but you see within Christ's church that there's a lot of people who are distorting what it even means to be a Christian anymore. Because they reduce the law to stuff that's on the outside. These Pharisees became all about rules and regulations and the, the one thing, and, the, and I see it time and time again when we were working through all of these parables, right, is that Christ wasn't about the outside. He wasn't about, you know, what people saw. And the one thing that we see over and over again, even specifically with the Pharisees, and it's the same thing he requires from us now, is the one thing that Christ wanted again and again and again was mercy, truth, justice, love. Those are what he was primarily concerned with. And the rich man lacked all of that in the story. And I wonder if they knew that that last verse that Christ dropped in that parable was very, very, very prophetic. Because he says to them, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. And I'll be honest with you, not only did one rise from the dead, two rose from the dead. And even more ironic is the, one that rose from, the first one that rose from the dead, what was his name? Lazarus. That's a beautiful foreshadowing, right? That he name drops <laughs> the guy who's going to be risen from the dead. So the rich man believed after it was too late. So my question is, is when will we believe? When will we believe? And when I mean believe, I think it's easy to say it with our mouth, but when will our life start showing that we believe, right? Where our, where our actions and our beliefs come together and they match, right? Like, what will it take? Because there's so many lessons to take away even just in this parable, right? First of all, you know, one of the things I'm going to ramble off some that I came, came up with is don't be the parent that lives a life that raises six of these kids. Like, don't be that parent, right? If, you're, if you've got kids, and even if you don't got kids, right, live your life and model what Christ is expecting us to see. Right? The second thing is, is don't be the rich man who indulges in things while you're completely ignoring the needs of those around you. That's a thousand percent wrong and perfectly clear here. Right? My other takeaway is maybe we're a Lazarus. Maybe we're in a position and it's a hard situation and it is tough. And I'm going to tell you, persevere. Endure. Because the one thing that we see in this story that not only... Was, there was a purpose that God was attempting to use Lazarus to purify this, this rich man, right? So there's a purpose to our struggle. There's a purpose in our enduring. But even more importantly than that, there's a reward. And how true is that? That a lot of the times the beginning of the story and the end of the story look very different. At the beginning of the story, nobody wanted to be Lazarus. Our heart broke for Lazarus. And if we were honest with ourselves, we wanted to be the rich guy. But when you look at the end of the story, there's only one person that we want to be. We want to be in the bosom of Abraham. But I think the most important part of the story is don't be the guy who waits too long. Don't wait until you run out of time and it's too late. So I'm going to tell you that our challenge for all of us is we need to look for the opportunities to bless those around us. We need to look to have mercy on people. And for us, for our faith, our beliefs, and our actions to all match up. For our sake, for the church's sake, for our children's sake, for the unbelievers' sake, because that is how we reached an unsaved people group. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Let's stand up and pray. Mothers uh, holding children are exempt from that, if you'd like. But.
In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in the name of one God, amen. Dear Lord, we thank you for this parable, Lord, and all, all your truth. Because, Lord, there is so much, Lord. And I know that, you know, I wish it was so easy where, you know, we were either the rich man or we were Lazarus. Or, but in reality, I think that we all wrestle because we have a little bit of both. So, Lord, I ask that you just, you work with us, Lord. I ask that you open our eyes. And I ask that not a single person in this room, Lord, runs out of time. For I know that you are working a good work inside of us, Lord. I know that you are the one who is paving the road for us, Lord. You are the one who has set out good deeds for us to walk through. So, Lord, I ask that you just, you just open our eyes to those things, Lord. And I think so many times we get distracted with our riches, with our good stuff, with our indulgences. And I ask, Lord, that you just always keep our eyes on you. Stuff will never, ever make us happy, Lord. But you are the only one that satisfies. And so I ask that today be the day, Lord, where we offer it all to you, that we submit to you, Lord. More importantly, Lord, that this is the day, Lord, where we hear you speak to us individually to guide us throughout this path. I ask that you have mercy on us, Lord. That you forgive us our many sins, Lord, because we need your mercy, Lord. And that you hear these prayers lifted in the session of all our saints from our tears. Here's where we pray one voice saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.